Well, hello, everyone. It is the uh, top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get things rolling here. Uh, welcome to the conversation today. Uh, we are going to be talking about Tin Can API Basics. And uh, we had 125 people register for today, so I am really looking forward to this topic. So to uh, introduce myself real quickly, I'm Amy Franco. I am the founder of Impact Instruction Group. And to share a little bit about what we do, we work with uh, organizations on custom learning and development solutions. And these are typically your blended solutions. They are technology-based solutions that they really range from support of large business initiatives all the way through single topics that are specific to your organization. So we have with us today Mike Rostasi. Mike, are you on the line? Can, uh, can you uh, let Hi. me know the tree uh, I am here, ready to go. All right, great. Thank you so much. So uh, part of uh, my role, part of what I like to do uh, in impact instruction, we really like to keep our eye on technology trends that are affecting what we as learning leaders and practitioners are, are doing every day. So these are the trends that really help inform learning strategy all the way through instructional design and development of training deliverables. So that's one of the reasons that we partnered up today with our friends at Rustacy Software. So I'll take a moment to introduce Mike Rustacy. Mike is the founder of the organization, and they have done much of the original work behind Tin Can API and also the Watershed Learning Record Store. So today we really use learning management systems to capture and quantify what people learn. So one of the things about these systems, though, is that they only have visibility into a tiny fraction of what a person's knowledge is and what their learning experiences are. And as we know, and I can pretty much speak from personal experience, uh, learning is happening everywhere. Uh, people are learning in many places. They are using tools in a lot of different ways and not just in a learning management system. So part of what we're going to do today is we are going to learn more about collecting those experiences that really matter to you and matter to your organization. And this is where the Tin Can API comes in. It's really changing the way that we collect those experiences in our organizations. And uh, this new API, what it is, it's a common language. It's a common language for many learning systems to speak about the, the many things and the many ways that people are learning. And so what that means for us, so us, whether we are a leader or we're a practitioner, it's opening our world to more data. It's opening our world to more meaningful data that can help us, whether we are a leader, making better decisions around strategy to support business initiatives, or maybe we are a practitioner today on the line, and if we are in that practitioner role, informing how we approach design, how we approach development to really meet the learner's need. We're collecting data to do decisions. And uh, today we have some, uh, some of the true experts on the topic. Uh, Mike uh, and his team at Rustacy Software, they have really graciously offered to share their time, to share their expertise with us to give us some more insights on this topic. Um, so just to walk you through real high level what we plan to talk about today, we are going to cover Tin Can Basics and how that's different from other learning standards. We are going to walk through how the API records activities and how it delivers data that is quantifiable, that's shareable, that's trackable. Uh, we'll also walk through some examples, some examples of real world applications by various organizations. And then also lastly, some simple and actionable steps that, that you can take to start utilizing and leveraging the technology. So uh, we like to keep things conversational and interactive around here. So we'll, we'll take some questions via chat. We'll also stop at a few places along the way to, to take any questions or comments that you have. So with that, uh, Mike, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Amy. I'm excited to be here talking with you guys. Uh, I, I love talking about this stuff. And so, yeah, as Amy said, feel free to throw questions into the chat panel, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. I know she mentioned we've got a bunch of people here. So if we can't get to all of them, one of the things we always do when we do these webinars, we make sure to answer every single question, uh, either during the webinar or afterwards via email. We'll, we'll follow up with all of those answers. So throw your questions into the, the chat area. I don't like talking to myself. I'd love for this to be 
as much of a conversation as possible. But I, I'm really excited about the changes coming to the industry and the progress that we're. I'm expecting us to see over the next few years lots of in, innovation uh, that is in store for you that I'm going to tell you a, a lot about over here. So I'm really excited about this stuff. I can talk for five hours to, if you'll let me. So, uh, but don't put throw some questions in there and, and turn this into a conversation. Uh, Amy kind of covered our background, so I'm not going to dwell too much on, on who I am. I don't like to talk about myself as much as I don't like talking to myself. So yeah, we're, we're a company that's basically helped people with SCORM for the last decade, and our software sits behind many of the tools. That, it's behind hundreds of LMSs, and it's behind authoring tools, Articulate and Captivate, and a bunch of other places. Our software's sitting behind a lot of things right now, and we have the opportunity to do the initial research that led to the formation of, of the Tin Can API that we're going to be talking about over here, and we continue to be really excited about that and, and lead its evangelism. So I want to start off with our, our first kind of quick poll question, so I know how to, to tailor the rest of this, um, this presentation. Real quick, how, how familiar are you with Tin Can? Let me just give you about you know, 15, 20 seconds there to put a response in there and see what we come up with over here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at those results. Are they up there? Anyway, I can't see them on my screen. <laughs> that's that's um, not a good thing. Can you see them? <laughs> yeah, I can see them here. So we have uh, the largest answers, uh, about 36% of folks, they've done some reading on the topic. Um, about half of us, we've heard the name, but not much more. And uh, we have about 10% 10 that are biggest fanboy and fangirl. So, so that, that's okay. the mix of the audience today. <laughs> okay, great. <clears throat> so that, that gives me a good sense of, of how to tailor this. And so I want to then start next with kind of setting the stage for, you know, what, what I think is happening here. And th this quote from Tom Friedman of the New York Times really sums up where I think we are in this industry. Tom says, big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And I would contend that in the online e-learning type space, we've been stagnant. We haven't evolved, and we haven't evolved for five, six, seven, eight years. It's been a long time since we've seen a significant wave of innovation come through our space. And I would contend that we are all desperately wanting for that to happen. And I also contend that Tin Can is going to act as a catalyst to make a lot of innovation and a lot of things suddenly possible. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of things Tin Can will enable and that will, are now going to be easy and new things that you can do. But as I do so, understand that I'm talking about it as a catalyst for a market to evolve. You know, Tin Can, I'll, I'll explain a lot more about what I mean here in a few minutes, but Tin Can doesn't per se do the things that I'm going to promise and talk about. It enables them to be done by an industry and to, as a catalyst for innovation. So let's, let's enough talking abstract. Let's dive into it. First of all, let's start with what is the Tin Can API? You may have Many of you have heard of it. There's already a bunch of you who are fanboys and girls. I hope by the end of this presentation to make all of you fanboys and girls for what is happening within the industry. So I'm going to presume that most of you are familiar with SCORM, the, the language that we've used for content to be published into learning management systems. This is something called an interoperability standard. It's a way different sets of software work together. At its most basic level, you can think of Tin Can, the Tin Can API as the next generation of SCORM. <clears throat> and it's in its early stages now, but it's been around for a few years, so some brief history. SCORM was created in the year 2000, no, that's 14 years ago, by a government research lab called ADL, Advanced Distributed Learning, the part of the Department of Defense. Well, in 2010, they finally realized, hey, you know, it's, it's time to create the next version of this specification. Ten years is an eternity in the world of technology. So they looked at a few ways of doing that. They looked at a bunch of different research efforts and things. And one of the ways they approached that problem was they gave our company, Rusty Software, a research grant. And 
we took that research grant and <clears throat> we conducted a project. We codenamed it Project Tin Can and spent a year gathering requirements and use cases and talking to people about what they want to be doing, the frustrations with SCORM and those kind of things, and we submitted a proposal. We called it the Tin Can API. And long story short, they liked it, and they then you use that as the foundation for this next generation of SCORM, and they've created an open community effort. This, the Tin Can API isn't something that Rust C software owns. It's not proprietary to us. It's not even something ADL fully controls. It's an, you can think of it as an open source. That's a little bit of a misnomer word, but conceptually, think of it as an open source specification that an entire community is working on, collaborating on, and coming together on to create the next generation of learning systems. Now, along the way, after at the end of that research project, Tin Can get got a really a lot of buzz and a lot of hype and everything around it, and it's still commonly known as the Tin Can API. ADL officially changed the name to the Experience API, that is sometimes abbreviated as X API or Zappy. So we're we're in a situation where we have you know m many names for this one thing. Tin Can is kind of the nickname that everybody still kind of calls it. The official name is the Experience API. But the point to leave here is when you hear people talking about those two things, they're the exact same things. Just people using different names for the same thing. You can kind of think of it as you know Wi-Fi is the common nickname for the IEEE 802.1.a. B, G, and N standards were kind of in a similar situation over here. <clears throat> so at, at a high level, TinCan is this next generation of SCORM. It's this way for learning systems to come together and communicate information. Specifically, what TinCan is doing is allowing us to record learning activity. It's, it's I won't get too technical in this webinar, but you can think of the Tin Can API as recording a series of statements of the form, I did this, an actor, a verb, and an object. And some of those statements might be, Mike completed course, Mike scored 85%, Mike attended webinar, Mike viewed video, Mike attended conference, Mike read a book. It's a very expressive language that allows us to capture many different learning activities that are happening, whether those are inside the LMS or outside of the LMS, whether they're online or offline in the real world or virtual world. It allows us to capture all of the learning activity that is happening for an individual or an organization, not just a very small subset of things that we were able to see previously. And so when I say that this is going to act as a market catalyst and <clears throat> allow us to do new and interesting things, this notion of an interoperability standard being a market force is an important one to take away. You know, I contend that an interoperability standard defines and confines an industry. So if you think about an analogy, a USB cable is an interoperability standard for the computer peripheral industry. If I'm a computer peripheral manufacturer and I want to sell my product on Amazon or at Best Buy, it needs to work with USB so I can go plug it into any of the consumer's computers. Well, in our world, our interoperability standard, SCORM, is 14 years old. That's an eternity. That's four generations in the world of technology. We're now updating that specification by four generations. That means the products that can come play in the market to be sold to a mass market can take advantage of all this te technology that's been you know, developed over the four, last 14 years that we have struggled with. You know, why, why have we struggled with mobile in our industry? It's because we haven't been able to mass market plug and play these products together. And that's what I mean by a market catalyst that's going to happen. <clears throat> so let, let's dive into then some of the new things that we can start to do and think about with Tin Can. The things that are now easy, the types of products we can bring into the market, the new things that we can do that we're going to see Tin Can start to catalyze. And when I, start, when I talk about these things, I like to use a layers of the onion analogy where we talk about the things Tin Can was designed to do on the surface. And we kind of peel back and look at some of the deeper implications of the way it, that are enabled by the way in which it was designed. So starting off at the high level, the you know, layer one of the tin can, and the stuff that's interesting on the surface is the ability to use any training modality, to deliver training however you would like to, however it is going to create the best educational experience for the learner. Often I think, you know, we, we deliver 
page turners in an LMS because that's what we have access to. That's the tool that we can use and that is easy. We're not going to be confined to things like that anymore. It's going to be a whole lot easier to do things like mobile, which I already mentioned, to use educational games, simulations. We're going to be able to incorporate real world activities a whole lot better, do things like deliver training in the moment of need to enable performance support. We're not going to be required to be in a browser or connected to the internet. We're going to be able to do things online or offline. But one thing I really encourage people to take away as I seek to become early adopters of Tin Can is to just rethink the learning experience from the ground up. And Imagine something that is ideal for the user, not something that's been confined to the box you've been in before. The next layer of the Tin Can Onion is the ability to recognize that learning is happening everywhere. Everything can be a learning event. If I, if I ask you, you know, in, the, in your life, what percentage of what you've learned personally has come from an e-learning course at an LMS? the things that we have monolithic systems to track. It's a minuscule percentage. It's teensy, tiny. It's embarrassingly small, but this is all the visibility of, that we have data. This is all of the data we have visibility into now in our organizations. Learning happens both formally and informally in the real world, the virtual world, online, offline, all of these things I've already mentioned. And with Tim Can, we can now start to capture that much broader picture of all of the learning events that are happening here. I've got some uh, screenshots up here. At the top, you see an I learned this bookmark. That's a simple way to just kind of track uh, some, you know, the fact that you read something or watched something in a browser. On the bottom, we've got a prototype of a book scanner that you, you scan the USB code of a book and report that you read that book. On the right there, I've got an early Tin Can adopter app called Tapestry, which is kind of like a, a four square for learning events. It allows you to check in to learning events. The, the next layer of the Tin Can I call Free the Data. As we did the Tin Can research project three years ago, you know, we, we talked to hundreds and hundreds of people about what are the problems with SCORM and the way the world works right now. And one of the biggest ones that we heard was SCORM allows me to collect a bunch of data, but then just kind of goes into my LMS and dies some violent death in a black hole never to be seen again. I want access to my data. I want to be able to analyze my data in different ways. I want data to be portable. I want data to be transferred across systems. Well, Tin Can is inherently open. Data that goes in can also come out. Data can be transported across systems. Uh, data goes into a learning record store and can be moved to another learning record store. And we're going to talk a lot more about this um, the structure here in the next few slides as well because I think this is one of the more transformational parts of what's happening here. The deepest layer of the Tin Can Onion, layer four, is the ability to correlate actual job performance and behavior data with training data. And this is massively important because of the way Tin Can is structured. It allows us not only to capture learning and training data, but also data about actual job performance and behavior. That means now we have a way to take all of this data in a common format, put it into a common place, and start to look for correlations. If we train people this way, does it change their behavior? We look at two different ways of training people, which one improves their performance most. This is really, really exciting stuff. When I first started using this layers of the onion analogy, uh, of, of saying, okay, yeah, layer four, that's something that'll happen in 10 years or whatever, and people finally get it. But a lot of the earliest adopters are jumping right down into, into these depths and doing some uh, amazing things. Um, hopefully I'll have time to share with you a, a story of a project we just did for AT&T that actually won a uh, Brandon Hall Gold Award for innovation recently, where they were looking at you know, compliance, different ways to do compliance training and looking at some really fascinating uh, things around that. So you know, that, that's the, the layers doing it. That's the high level impacts of things we can expect to happen in the industry. The ability to train however we want to using any type of delivery mechanism. The ability to track both formal and informal events, that broader swath of learning events. The ability for data to be moved around and to pull out really interesting reports and interesting ways. And then that ability to correlate performance and behavior data with the actual training outcomes. So, now I'm going to shift a little bit and talk um, about how 
the learning ecosystem is, is going to change. And a lot of this is driven by that third layer of the onion, the ability for that data to be free and move around. And so um, if we look at the slide here, we've got this is kind of our view into the world today. We've got users and they go to an LMS and yep, that's kind of what we see and what we know about, but that's not the real world. We all know that learning happens in many other places. It's happening on the web or talking to mentors and classes, videos, all these other things are happening, but they're not in our learning management. We don't know, we don't have any visibility into what's happening here. We don't understand it. We don't see what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we go look at our learning systems today and they do 50 different things. So these monolithic systems that do all kinds of, of different things. Um, and also, very often, they don't tie in well to the other systems that we have in our enterprise. Or if they are tying in to those systems that we have in our enterprise, it's because we paid um, you know, an Accenture or a Booz Allen or any of these other big integrators many, 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 many thousands of dollars to create this one-off integration and tie these things together and then you're never allowed to touch it ever again because nobody wants to break it and have to call in the multi-hundred dollar an hour consultant to come fix it. So, but if you look at kind of the 80-20 the rule, which pervades many different types of systems, but in, in software it says, you know, typically 20% of the functionality provides 80% of the value. And uh, the two bubbles that I have highlighted here, I would contend provide much more than 80% of the value. They're much more, they're the big part of the reason we use learning management systems. We use learning management systems to deliver content and to track who's done what. We, we've got all this other baggage and functionality built in to the LMS. And the reason those things have to be built into the LMS right now is because there isn't an existing interoperability standard that allows us to plug them in. And take the bottom left there, social learning. You know, uh, everybody wants to do social learning or whatever, and so the natural reaction from the learning space was, let's put that functionality into our LMS. Well, your LMS is never, ever, ever going to be as good of a social system as a dedicated company that does social system, like a Jive or a Yammer or something along those lines. But because there's no way to easily tie Jive and Yammer into an LMS, we had to shove that functionality into the LMS. Well, that's that's what has changed. Now, we now have the way to tie data in from those best of breed learning experience delivery systems into, and get that data into our centralized learning record store to track the results. And so, for sake of discussion, let's put some names on these bubbles. Uh, on the top, the content delivery is something we call a training delivery system, something that just simply delivers training to use just pushes training out there. In the middle there, that tracking system is something we've been, you've heard me use the phrase a couple times already in this presentation of a learning record store, an LRS. And a learning record store has proven to be a really kind of popular new class of system that we have seen emerge almost accidentally out of this tin can effort now that it is possible to do this. There's a lot of people who are very interested and say, just give me this core of the learning management system. Just this thing that tracks all of this data is able to understand the very, very broad and diverse set of tin can data that's coming into it and give me some really interesting analytics and reports to run on that data and let that data be free and let that data serve other parts of the system. And so we're starting to see people reconceptualize the learning architecture within an organization to look something like this. You have a learning record store at the center that captures data from many different places. Perhaps you have a trained delivery system to push data out. Sometimes the, the LMS is that, the thing that pushes your compliance training out to the people who need to do it. But then the, the tie-ins to the rest of the enterprise are all kind of open and can happen via this open standard now. We can push, we can have those tighter integrations with our HR systems. We can push out to reporting systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this is really causing people to rethink how they think about learning in the enterprise. And <clears throat> so another way to look at that model is here. We've got the learning record store in the center. And along the bottom here, we have a number of activity providers, 
ex places where learning experiences are happening that record all of those learning experiences in a learning record store. But then remember, a tin can's inherently open. That data can go out to many places. It could go out to LMSs that are systems of record and keep track of the high-level transcript level data. It can go out to other specialized reporting tools. Now, I, I, one story I, I love from early tin can adoption stuff is you know the story of an airline. And we're, I was talking about tin can and all this type of stuff. And you know, we're talking about okay, um, we can. They used a, a big LMS. I think it was Saba that they were using. And I say, okay, great. We can get all this data into Saba or whatever, but we have, we you know, we have many regulated job functions. We have pilots, we have flight attendants, we have ground crew, et cetera, et cetera. And, and additionally, we operate in 100 countries, and so we have compliance requirements across all of these different job functions across all these different countries. And you know, there's no way Saba is ever going to give us the specific report we need to know if our flight attendants in Paris are certified according to whatever crazy tracking scheme they have in France. But one of the great parts about Tin Can is Saba doesn't need to provide all of those things. Some enterprising young entrepreneur in France could create the French flight attendant certification checklist reporting tool that pulls the data out of SABA. Remember, Tin Can's inherently open. We can have a specialized reporting tool bolt on to a, you know, a generic repository and give you specialized views into this data. Similarly, you could have you know, Boeing could produce a tool that allows that same airline to download the data from one of the flight simulators that wound up in the centralized LRS. We could have the centralized LRS that understands all of these things and then different reporting tools to put different visualizations on that that are really particular. This is a huge potential win for people who you know really have specialized needs and want to look at their data in different ways. So you know, taking another taking that diagram and zooming out a level too becomes more, you know, the traditional learning systems around the vertical axis over here. But let's add this horizontal axis now of what's important to the business. We, if we consider the fact that learning data in and of itself is only marginally interesting, but it becomes much more valuable when we tie it in with actual job performance data and use that to drive business intelligence. This is, I think, a massive potential transformation that as we move into an increasingly knowledge-based economy where talent is the most precious commodity, we can start to now move the training organization from this cost center that keeps our butts covered for compliance to a strategic imperative if we can show that the training and learning programs that we are delivering are actually developing our people and improving their performance. That brings us right up into the you know, C-suite level visibility and a strategic asset to the organization. So I'm super fired up to see some of these trends start to emerge and organizations heading in these directions. So another uh, real quick poll question over here, if we can throw that one up. Do you work in an organization with more than one LMS? How many of you people are in this predicament? We've, we've heard this from people going back through the ages. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll. And Amy, if you could read off the results for me there. Yeah, let's see what's, uh... all right, so I have them up here. So um, do you work with an organization with more than one LMS? So we had 27% of folks saying yes, they do, and then 73% of folks saying no, that they don't. <laughs> Okay, 23%. That's actually a whole lot lower than what we typically average. We typically get about 50 or 60% people say they do work in an organization with more than one LMS. It's a very okay. common very common thing to have where we've got each department has their own LMS, and each department has their own LMS for good reason. You know, this, the sales department has different training needs than a compliance department, which is different from an accounting department often or international, whatever department you want to have. Yeah, I've seen that a lot where you have yeah. large, especially large organizations, multiple LMS across the enterprise. Yeah, absolutely. Or as a result of a merger and acquisitions yep. and things, it's just, you know, these, these things proliferate. Um, 
And it's often hard to get people to change off the system, but there is often a need to have all of that data in one centralized place so you can have a comprehensive view of an employee no matter what part of the organization that they may have traveled through. And so that's another you know, great possible solution that Tim Kant starts to offer. Remember, data is inherently open. It's portable. It crosses through all of these different systems. An organization can have a centralized learning record store that pulls all of those records from each of those LMSs, still let each department use their own LMS to meet their particular needs, but bring all of that data together in one centralized location so we can have visibility into it. You know, similarly, this enables us to share data across LMSs I mentioned, and you know, that, that allows us to potentially share, that doesn't have to be limited to within an organization. You know, I, I like to use my wife as an example. Beth is a physical therapist at a local you know, community-oriented hospital over here called Williamson Medical Center. Well, if she was to get a new job down the street at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, she'd have to go back and take a whole bunch of compliance training and you know, other introductory type stuff that she's taken over the years. And that's a massive waste of time for Beth and for Vanderbilt and for everybody involved. But now with Tim Can, that data can travel with her. It's now possible from a technical perspective to you know, have a push of a button and send data between those two LMSs and have our records flow with her. Now, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination claiming that this is all possible legally, business-wise, politically. There are still plenty of concerns to overcome from a non-technical perspective, but the technology is there to now enable these things to start to happen. And you know, this is already out there, alive and functional. Data is able to be transferred across LRSs. It's proven, it's happening, it's working, it's out there in the world. But really, if you take a look at that model, um, it, you know, is that the best model for the world? If we, if we look at Beth again, shouldn't she own those learning records? Why, why is it that Williamson Medical Center owns Beth's learning records? Isn't that kind of like her resume? Isn't that part of who she is? The other thing that's now technically enabled is the concept of what we call a personal data locker, a PDL. The ability to have all of this information stored in one place where I can have my, all my learning records, be they from school or my formal learning activities and um, in the workplace or informal stuff that I've had, and then maybe I can share subsets of that with different audiences and allow <coughs> allow different people to see sets of things like that. This is now also something that is te suddenly technically possible. Again, business, political, whatever non-technical concerns are out there. But this is the type of thing that you know a Google or a LinkedIn or a Facebook or something like that is going to put a millions and millions of dollars into. Somebody's going to make this happen as this technology starts to emerge. And so uh, I've been talking for a, a good while. Now I just want to take a, a quick pause and see if um, we had many questions coming out over there. Um, and, and I'm seeing there aren't all that many coming through right now. Do you, is there anybody who wants to throw one out there right now? Or if, if we don't see any in the next few seconds, I'll just go ahead and, and keep on going and, and take most of them at the end there. Yeah, Mike, I had a, uh, this is Amy, I had a, a just a question came up as I was looking at some of the different places that you can pull the data from. Um, if Are you seeing anything in terms of pulling data from like ERP systems or CRM systems, you know, in terms of that, that business intelligence side of things, we tend to do a lot of training that can be systems related. So just curious to see what, what you guys are seeing there in, on the data side. Yeah, so that's a great question. Absolutely, the data is coming from many of those other enterprise-oriented systems. And, for, you know, as we speak to this, you know, remember I'm speaking about the things that are going to be catalyzed and happen. Right now, in a lot of the early work that we're doing, we're, going, we're having to pull that data. We're going to ha we have to go make those connections manually and stuff. The key enabler for this to happen is the fact that TinCan is actually based on another technology called Activity Streams that was developed by Google, Facebook, Twitter, et al. And Activity Streams is where the actor verb object that I did this 
structure is coming from. And we're increasingly seeing activity streams being adopted by many enterprise level tools that are publishing what is happening in those tools as an activity stream. As these two trends continue, the adoption of activity streams across enterprise software and tin can across learning systems, that's as we, when we start to see all this data start to flow seamlessly in all together. So next, I've got a long question coming up in my window over here. Um, it's asking about the complex, the challenging complexity of queries. Doesn't TinCam make the complexity of writing queries for summary data much harder and therefore create more of a black hole? We currently use a BI tool to write reports against relational databases and tables in a data mark. What is the data structure of an LR? Oops. What is the data structure of the LRS? LRS just one massive table, et cetera. How do you join? How do you do the queries? So that is a great question. And actually, you're hitting on the hardest challenge that TinCan is offering here. TinCan allows us to capture and report on a very large, relatively unstructured pile of data that can have many different meanings. You know, you can have a statement of Mike graduated Harvard and Mike watched YouTube video, and they come in with equal equivalents. How do you figure out which ones are important? And then similarly, you have, you know, okay, Mike watched a Khan Academy video, and Mike watched Gangnam Style. Well, Khan Academy video, that's, def that's an obvious learning event, but Gangnam Style, what does that mean? Does that mean that Mike's wasting time at work? Does it mean he's an idiot for reporting this to his learning record store? Or does it mean that he's studying South Korean pop dance culture? Uh, so there's you know a big problem of trying to make meaning out of this data and understand it. And to, to get to the question asker's point, the data structures that are used to represent this information are going to be complicated. And I think that is the secret sauce of what the LMS implementers need to be able to do is find ways to take this unstructured set of data and turn it into structured and meaningful data. I'll touch a little bit more about how we particularly approach that uh, a little bit later on and I'm happy to dive into some more of those things. But yeah, I think that it becomes the job of the LRS is to take the complicated unstructured stuff and turn it into simplified structured stuff. And I'm not going to pretend that there are easy answers to that question right now. That's, you know, that's one thing we've had you know, some of our smartest developers grinding on over here for the last 18 months or so. And I think we're, uh, <clears throat> we've made a lot of progress, but I don't think that us or the industry is there yet either, easier. Um, another, another question about log files. Uh, someone wants to see a demo of how the API actually works. I'm getting lots of information about it, but how does it work? Um, so I, I could answer that question with a, a technical answer of how does it work, and I'll then I can show you, then I can also answer with a conceptual, how does it work in practice? Because I'm not sure which angle we're getting at there. I'll be, I'll be very high level on the technical stuff because I don't think this is a, probably a very technical audience, but I'm happy to, I'm a, I'm a developer, I'm a geek at heart, I'm happy to dive in deep into the technical stuff um, some other time if you want me to. So to just touch on the, the technical surface of things, TinCan is a RESTful API that sends representations of statements via JSON. Um, for non-technical people, that means TinCan works the, rest, the same way the rest of the modern web works. Um, these statements, again, are represented of the form I did this, actor, verb, object. Um, the activity provider initiates a query, initiates a REST response to the learning record store to post a series of these statements. There is also a REST-ish protocol for those activity providers and other systems to query the learning record store to get particular subsets of records out. From a more practical perspective, how does this work in the real world? Um, it's a great question and one that isn't completely answered yet. So, and, it can, and it's not completely answered yet because it can happen many ways and I think we still have a ton of innovation to see. In the ideal sense, you know, the learner, the learner should never see this. It's sitting in the background. It's a thing that geeks know about and allows us to communicate things on the back end. It's simply a tool for shuffling data around. You can have your same learning experiences that you have now um, and then you, they just continue to be there, but we can have better ones that all have this stuff communicating in the background. That's what I call kind of 
passive tin can. It's just a way for systems to communicate data in the back end. The learner doesn't know that it exists. As we get into concepts like tracking informal learning or this personal data locker, there may come a time where we have sufficiently incented the learner to want to record learning events on their own. That bookmark is an example of how that might work, where you've got a button in your browser and you click on I learned this and it shows what is happening over there. You know, other examples of how that could work, and I don't know how it is going to work because we you know, haven't seen it fully yet. Uh, you know, what if this go to webinar control panel that I'm looking at here had a button for record to learning record store, and I pushed a button on here and it looked at all of the attendee names and made a state made a series of statements to the learning record store that each of you attended, or Maybe your Google or Outlook calendar has something where you can record the fact that you were in this session or this meeting. You know, the, there are tons of ways where this stuff, or maybe you know, you're at a conference and you always get the mobile app that lists the sessions and you sign up for your sessions. What if that then just allowed you to record those things into your learning record store? The, the point is there are, that our lives are increasingly controlled and pervaded by electronic devices that know what we're doing. And so there's many, many, many ways we could start to capture these things. And I think we've only touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of the innovation that we're going to start to see around them. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start to focus on, you know, okay, what can we do today? What are some of the things that other organizations are using this for right now? And you know, what, what are some of the things, what are some of the great, the interesting case studies of things people are doing? <coughs> so first of all, just kind of starting with some of the uh, high level features of what people are working on. A lot of people are doing, um, we're using TinCan to track what we call accomplishments or badges. TinCan now provides a way to, you know, we can define a badge or an accomplishment, and then we've got all of these different ways we could go about earning those. There's a lot of people doing interesting work around, around that, defining accomplishments and letting people go earn them in a variety of different ways. Uh, we have business analytics as well. Actually, this is a, um, a screenshot from what I teased you with earlier, that uh, AT&T project that won a you know, Brandon Hall Gold Award. And what they were doing is they did an experiment where they looked at delivering high fidelity compliance training versus low fidelity compliance training. Now, your basic the low fidelity was here's the PDF for a compliance policy, go read it. And the high fidelity was a really interactive video-based simulation and they wanted to look and say, okay, we really care about this compliance training. Does the high fidelity training that we have to spend much more time and money and effort and energy on actually move the needle in terms of its effectiveness? And so they looked at a bunch of different metrics from how engaged people were in both sets of training, their kind of level one attitudes about their training, their level two knowledge increase, but then all the way into how, um, how many calls to the help desk did each control group, did each group make about compliance violations after receiving the two different forms of training to compare which one was actually more effective. And to, to do this required data analysis across you know, half a dozen different systems that, and none of which were an LMS. They were able to pull all this data together using TIDCAM, bring it all together and do some really interesting business level analytics on the training program. Uh, another one, learning analytics. Uh, people are looking at their, they're taking their existing learning programs and they're able to use Tin Can to capture so much more data than they were ever able to do using SCORM that they can really take a deep dive into the effectiveness of their training, where people are getting stuck, how the training is working. An interesting side effect actually from that same at and project, which we did a, a webinar on recently, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into that, we can point you into, point you to a, a recording of that. And one of the things they found on there was technical support was so much easier on the, the simulation they were delivering because they had so many recordings of events that can actually trace the exact path a, a learner took. That was a really interesting side effect. Uh, similar to business analytics outcome uh, analysis, you know, this is um, this screenshot here is uh, from a, a project we did actually with Google where they were looking at, again, a sale. This was a simulation was related to sales, and they were looking at which they, they used the simulation to measure people's propensity to exhibit 
different selling behaviors, and those were kind of tied to learning objectives. But then what they did was they correlated that with data from the CRM to look and say, okay, which of these behaviors that we were training on is most closely correlated to improving your sales closing rate? Uh, really, really powerful stuff over there. Uh, people are using this stuff to allow people to train in kind of this skills practice mode where you, you're not, you know, going in, taking a course, and you pass or fail, but it's really kind of this gamified, go in and practice your skills, you know, kind of the way learning should be, more akin to some of the games that my elementary school age kids play and love to do for homework versus, you know, you must go take your training and finish. But they still want to have visibility into that data. They want to go look at how, how much people are using these things, how well they're performing on different skills and those kind of things. Uh, another really popular one is to do deeper question test analysis than you can typically do in systems right now. There's, you know, there's, there's pretty pictures on the screen here. These aren't things that we couldn't do before, uh, but they're just a lot, a lot harder to get at all of the data and to, to look at things other than unless we're using specialized um, questioning tools, a question mark or something like that, for instance. Now we can look at question test analytics analysis stuff from data coming in from any different tool. So I'm going to switch over and just kind of talk about some, a few real world examples of how some of these early adopters have been uh, have been using TinCan. So uh, one of the earlier ones, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, a company here in, in Nashville with us, they've been kind of doing several of the things we diagrammed earlier, consolidating the data from many LMSs into a learning record store, and then using that same learning record store to track many of the things that they didn't previously have visibility into, um, then publishing that data out into their kind of overall business analytics system. They're a great example of a very early adopter moving to this kind of next generation architecture. Uh, a fun example, a, company, a software company called Altair, They're, they provide an engineering kind of CAD software program. They're using TinCan to track how people are using their software program and also the learning events that happen to go see is did the learning actually change how they use the software, but also then to do the opposite, to say we notice that they're using the software incorrectly, let's give them some supplemental learning. Uh, University of Michigan Health System, <coughs> another one of my you know, favorite use cases, Alan over there is doing all kinds of fun, innovative stuff with TinCan. The story I like to tell is the way they reinvented some of their new hire training for, I believe it was nurses relating to medical equipment. Uh, what they did was they kind of turned into a scavenger hunt. They put a QR code on a bunch of different medical devices out there, and the new hire nurse goes around it with her mobile device and scans the QR code and gets the training on that device as she's standing right in front of the device. Uh, but then later on, when come back to this you know, six months down there and you have to use the device, that sc scanning that same QR code turns into a performance support tool, allowing you to get, get the refresher training that you need. And I love how this kind of blends the virtual world and the real world training with performance support and uh, you know, how it really uses something like mobile to take the full, it takes full advantage of mobile, not just delivering a course on the mobile device, it takes advantage of the fact that we can now blend that virtual world and real world. Um, I already mentioned some that, that Google project we were working on earlier. They were also looking at the, you know, some of the different competencies exhibited within that simulation and tracking those, and comparing competencies across different teams or whatever. Um, a company called Devereaux, one of the things they're doing that was really interesting, they have a excuse me, something called their, a risk score for each of their, they do mental health clinics, I believe. <coughs> they have risk scores for each of those clinics based on a number of factors that they monitor. And they wanted to go in and see, okay, if, if we're going and having a training observer go in there and do a performance observation periodically, how long does that impact last? How long is it leading to a decreased risk score after we do the observation to go then develop the optimal timing for those observations? Uh, Catholic Relief Services, they're, um, they've got a, a great simulation related to dealing with a disaster, going ahead and getting set up you know, in a country after a natural disaster. 
and they wanted to look at, they kind of have an ideal path that people take through this simulation. They wanted to look at when learners diverted from that path and, and how did those diversions happen. And did they, once they diverted, did they stay on the wrong path or did they get back on course and you know, taking a really interesting look into there. Um, uh, another one I threw in here, Lifeway, I threw them in to brag a little bit because we got a Silver Brandon Hall Award for, for them as well. Um, I, I say that to let you know about how exciting a lot of these early tin can projects are. A lot of these companies that are early adopters are really being recognized as thought leaders in this space right now. This is kind of a, the next generation. This is where the innovation and the action is, is happening right now. And uh, a lot of these organizations that are diving into this are having tremendous early success with things and getting a lot of visibility. But, uh, what Lifeway was doing was tying in a bunch of, of video stuff and, and mobile stuff and bringing a bunch of stuff together that they couldn't bring together with their traditional LMS actually to train um, ministers at churches uh, of all things. One of the interesting parts of my job is we get to work with all these learning providers that are in all these little niches that you'd never, you can never imagine how many of them are out there. It's really kind of cool. So, you know, I want to bring up this next slide to kind of show you this is happening. This is a, a tin can adopter slide. It's probably a few months old by now. Uh, this number is growing every day. There's tons and tons of vendors who are jumping in on these on this stuff and making it happen. Uh, it takes a long time for a vendor to adopt the technology and for then customers to get those updates and then to start to enable it to happen. But that, that snowball is certainly rolling. And one of the interesting things I like to point out about this slide is the names you recognize and the names you don't. You're seeing a, a, a lot of you know the, the big learning companies on there. You know, start right at the top. You've got Articulate Blackboard front and center up there at the top row. Um, you know, the, the names you recognize, they're, all, they're diving in, they're supporting this, they're getting behind it, but it's the names that you don't recognize. The people that have been, have tools that have been kind of tangential to the learning industry that haven't been able to enter our space because their tool didn't fit into the SCORM box and thus they couldn't bring it to a mass market. Those companies are entering the space and bringing in tons of innovation and interesting things that are happening. So, you know, quick question we get a whole bunch from people is, you know, how do we migrate from SCORM? Um, and I want to start with saying you don't have to. You know, nobody's going to come in and say, you must make everything tin can right now, and that's how it shall be. And if they do, then you've got a bad boss. But, you know, this transition is going to be kind of like the transition from, you know, VHS to DVD or more aptly VHS jumping straight to streaming video. You know, DVD has been around for 20 years or so right now, but only in the last couple of years did I throw away my VCR. I still have a drawer full of tapes for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and this is going to be a very similar transition. SCORM's not going to go away. And you're going to see things produced with SCORM for a long time, a long, long time to come. You know, LMSs and other systems will support and play SCORM content for a long, long time to come, probably decades. Um, but now, you know, Tin Can is then going to start to jump in when we have um, more interesting use cases. When we have needs that aren't met by SCORM, you're going to start to see people using Tin Can. It's going to be a gradual transition to where Tin Can becomes the predominant standard and SCORM kind of goes away. <coughs> um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there <laughs> with the cough. So the, the, another thing to note is there is also a direct migration path from SCORM to Tin Can. It's very straightforward, and in fact, there's tools and, that you can play SCORM content and have all that stuff translated to Tin Can. So uh, we, can, we can do a whole webinar on this path, and ADL is actually producing a SCORM to Tin Can migration document here soon. But uh, you know, the, these are things that are, it's not a transition to worry about. So, you know, where does that leave the LMS? That's another question I get asked is, you know, is the LMS dead? Is the LRS going to take over? And I don't think the answer is yes. I think that, you know, uh, I think the LMSs serve a, a big purpose in organizations and obviously do many things that learning record stores aren't going to do. I, I see these things evolving, at least for the near term, kind of in parallel with different organizations using di things in different ways, but I certainly don't think that the LMS is dead. Um, the question I get a whole bunch about, you know, how do I get started? 
one of the things we are always advising our customers is we're, we're trying to rein them in and encouraging them not to try to boil the ocean. I can give this presentation and get the crowd fired up with all these great things that we can do. And a customer will come and say, I want to do all of that. And we say, no, start small. Start with one small capability, one small project. We like to encourage people to connect narrow things to solve specific problems. Let's go in and introduce this technology in a way that accomplishes one milestone, allows us to then, you know, introduce kind of that scientific method, experiment centered analysis into the organization as we're introducing that new technology. Ask a question and then use the fact that we can collect more data to answer that question. Uh, and we we very you know this is kind of the old model of what we the data visibility we had before we, we pre-assessed, we trained, and then we post-assessed. Well, we can do a whole lot more than that. We can deliver so many other activities that we can fold into the training program. And then uh, more than just doing you know, traditional post-assessment of the learner, we can look, look at changes in behavior, individual performance, and organizational performance as well. Take a, a really much broader look at how we are looking at all of this data. So uh, that's the end of my talking for a while now. I've got a bunch of questions in the chat window that I'll try to get to here. Uh, but I just want to you know, take this opportunity and thank you guys for listening to me babble on for a little while. And, I'll, and also let you know that we are happy to have this conversation one-on-one -on -one with your organization. I love talking about this stuff. And if there are, are more people in your organization who would like to hear about these things or if you want to talk about how it would apply to your organization, let us know. We are absolutely happy to have that conversation with you at any time. No hard sales pitch or anything along those lines. We really just want to see people start to adopt this technology and to take advantage of everything that it has to offer over here. So um, I've got about five minutes left and a few questions over here. Let me go through the question box here. So which, with which SCORM versions is TinCan API compliant? Uh, the answer is none. Of them, Tin Can is new. It is not, you know, it is not Swarm. Um, you know, use that analogy from DVD to or VHS to DVD as well. It's a new thing and a different thing. Or go all the way to streaming video. VHS to streaming video. You can still play a movie with a streaming video, just like you could still play a movie on VHS. And in that sense, it does the same thing, just using a different delivery mechanism. But it then allows you to do a bunch more. You can have things like you know, YouTube or Netflix and all these types of things that you couldn't do before with the old model. Uh, another question over here. Articulate uses tin can. How? I don't th see anything beyond SCORM in that publishing tool. That's a great question and an interesting topic to talk about. And it goes right into the question of how are vendors adopting tin can. And I pointed out the new vendors and the old vendors in that adopters slide there. And it's an interesting thing to watch the industry dynamic of how existing vendors will be adopting tin can when you consider the fact that they have been very successful, many of them, over the last decade living within the SCORM box. For them to do new things that are outside of the SCORM box requires them to rethink their tool. And so let's take Articulate as an example, and I love to talk about them. They've been customers of ours forever. I love those guys. They're great people over there. So I can talk about them. You know, Articulate has produced rapid authored e-learning courses, and they will continue to do that, and they will do that very well. And so for them, adopting Tin Can, what does that mean? Well, it means that they can swap out the plumbing of SCORM for Tin Can, and that's going to allow them to do things like deliver storyline content on the standalone iPad app that they couldn't do with SCORM. It's going to allow them to do kind of disconnected things as well and give you some other advantages, but Tin Can itself doesn't change what their tool does. It allows them the freedom to cr make their tool do new things. And they've started to do that by having the mobile app for Storyline. But it doesn't go all of a sudden turn Articulate into an informal learning and performance support tool. They need to go do that. That same dynamics at place on the LMS side, where you look at a lot of the adoption, and they do it at what I call the SCORM parity level where they're doing the same things they could do with SCORM. 
that you know, have made them successful for the past decade, only they're using the new plumbing to go do that. Uh, and then you're seeing new people entering the market doing you know, the new and innovative type stuff as well. So the, the adoption paradigm for existing vendors is going to be a really interesting one to watch. Do they fully embrace all the power of all of this stuff, or do they cling to the legacy model and just give a nod to the new technology because they know they have to? It's been really interesting, too, to watch some LMS providers who are really prescient think of themselves both as consumers of tin can data as well as publishers of tin can data. They'll bring data in from courses that they complete, but then they'll also publish everything that happens in the LMS as a tin can data feed. So uh, time for one more quick question here. So should there be a published as tin can in our content creation tools? What about Adobe and Microsoft Office? Are they included yet? Yeah. Uh, ideally, yes. You know, uh, all the e-learning content tools will soon have a published to tin can. Most of the major ones already do. Um, but then what about you know, more generic tools like Office and Adobe and those types of things? You know, it's possible. I don't know when this will uh, right now, I'm really focused on let's get this adopted within the learning space. I don't know when that adoption will start to bleed out of the learning space into more mainstream tools. And you know, we've talked with a lot of evangelists within this industry who are really excited about that possibility. We're trying to get them mostly to focus on let's get it really adopted in the learning industry and then let it bleed out into other spaces. But it is very possible that you, you could start to see it in some of the, the broader tools as well. So I, I think that's the, the top of the hour. I want to thank you again for, um, for listening to me and let you know if you have any questions. My contact information is up there on the screen. Happy to talk about this stuff anytime. And thank you, Amy, for, for having me. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you want to say anything to wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, thank you so much uh, to you and your team for, for sharing all of this with us. I, I know the first time I saw, saw you speak at a couple of conferences, it really just opened my eyes to how we as learning practitioners or leaders, we really have to um, know about these techniques technologies and like you said it's been 14 years uh, since you know SCORM was introduced into the market and how these technologies are really changing the game. And I would encourage for all of you that are listening out there and you participated today, if you are more on the, the ID technical side or if you are on the, the business leadership side, I would encourage you to think about a problem that you are trying to solve, a business problem you're trying to solve, and how we might be able to look at how the technology of Tin Can can help you solve that, as Mike was sharing earlier, to start with something small and then build it out from there. So I would really encourage you to uh, jump out to this, this link that's provided on the screen in front of you or to reach out to me or Mike personally. And if you'd like to have uh, an additional conversation, some additional demo, um, it definitely no pressure situation just to learn more about the technology and how it might be useful for you. Um, so with that, Mike, if if, uh, if you didn't have any other any other closing comments, we can go ahead and uh, close the webinar for today. That sounds good. Thank you, everybody. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.